This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. We are here live. We're here live both on Instagram and Pet Life Radio with Dr. Jeff Weber for the next 30 minutes here on Pet Life Radio's Ask the Best with Dr. Jeff. Here for you, here for your pets. Any questions you have, now is the time to ask because guess what? The advice is for me. And um, sometimes I'm wrong, but most of the times I'm doing okay. I got a pretty high percentage going. So, uh, morning, good morning. And I uh, love to uh, see some new names here, which is great. Thank you so much. And I hope you come away with something. Uh, something more more than before you got here you know i gotta say i gotta give a shout out to my friend michael hearn strikers world if you follow either one and uh he, we've been sharing a, a post it all started with uh, someone posted something about their dogs sleeping on the bed and getting hair all over the place and is that a problem and who really cares right well i would say i'm very happy to say that the vast majority i'm talking in the high 90s said oh of course that's have pets they're going to sleep in bed with us i mean that's what there are some people that said oh my god how dare you you can't and you know it's interesting because there are some and again don't get mad at them but there are some board certified veterinary behaviorists that actually would recommend against having your pets sleep in bed with us now do i believe that absolutely not because my dogs and even cats have been on the bed for as long as i've ever had them and never had a problem they still are well behaved they listen they say that you're giving them like that they're equal to you and then they're going to challenge you and they're not going to behave well. They're not going to listen to you. I have not seen that. I'd love to know how many of you have experienced that, but you know, it's really one of those things that it never dawned on me. They know their place and it, look, it's not just for them. I, it's not just for them to come sleep on the bed. I, I like it. I sleep on the bed. They're such great cuddlers, you know, really while you're here answering Give me a question. What do you think? Are you a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Should we allow our pets to sleep on the bed with us? Give me a thumbs up. Let me know. And uh, if not, let me know that too. To me, it's absurd. Now, Susie Bike 51, are you asking for a review, a, um, to view a request to join if you meant it? Because some people, yeah, there's a thumbs up. Thank you. And uh, Jamie Lynn. So love it. So if you really want to talk to me, ah, <laughs> New York, I love it. Bethany, all dogs sleep on the bed. Steve, <laughs> there you go. Like I said, there's a great cartoon I have. So what it is, oh, I love this. This is so great. So there's a great cartoon. It's two part. The first top upper part is a woman sleeping in bed. And you can see the other side of the bed is empty. And all the dogs are literally surrounding her. Then all of a sudden, you see one of the dogs, the captain says, quick, hurry up. Here he comes. Here he comes. And all the dogs spread out all over the bed. And now even they take over the empty side, which is obviously the husband's side. And the husband's <laughs> bed, scratching his head like, oh, what do I do now? But that's exactly, exactly what, you know, how I feel. I would rather sleep on the floor than disturb my, <laughs> my dogs who are just so comfortable in bed. But that's me. Anyway, I bought dog toothpaste in a tube. And a dog toothpaste spray, what do you use for your dogs? So, you know, I don't recommend any particular, the classic brand was called CET, but now that Queen all, there are so many companies that have toothpaste. When you have a doggy toothpaste, you're looking for something, obviously, that is non-sudging, so it's swallowable, because I've never been able to teach a dog to spit out the, the excess, and usually flavored. It could be beef, it could be chicken. For cats, they love shrimp flavor, so that's what I do. And then the other thing, and what I may do I don't have my dog with me now, but next week, if somebody wants to remind me, I'm going to show you a technique that I have learned that I use for my dogs. And I do it even in an office with a dog, right? Who already, they come in and say, there's no way I can brush his teeth. They won't let me in. And so I'll give you a trick that seems to work for me. And it really is great. So I'll think about it next time. I'll grab one of my dogs with me. TCAP 10. But my dog sleeps next to me on her bed. She's a good sleeper. But past two days, I've been moving to the floor or rug. If she's just hot, maybe we need to lower the AC temp. That, you know, look, I have five dogs. And they usually start. And through the, sometimes during the night, because I have beds on the floor, their own beds, lined up all over the place. One or two of them will hop off the bed and find a nice comfy spot in their own bed. That's okay. My point is, I don't want to chase the dogs off the bed. I don't want to not. And truthfully, I don't care about the hair. I come home every day loaded with hair. 
That's what a washing machine is for. That's what a lint brush is for. You don't necessarily have to worry. Oh my God, so I have hair on me. I mean, when I get home, sometimes I think that my dogs get mad at me because they think I'm cheating on them because I come home and I have smells all over me. I have dog hair or cat hair all over me. That's life. Uh, when I signed up to be a veterinarian, I wasn't expecting, you know, in fact, my very first boss, my only boss, really, except this short stint when I was, I had sold to VCA and then I had a boss. Didn't work out very well. But my very first boss, he, I noticed he was, he was a very well-dressed guy and very successful, very successful. And he would wear like gabardine slacks and Gucci loafers. And I never saw, never, ever saw him on the floor with a bed. He always had a technician in the room with him who lifted it. And he was almost like, almost like a foot away from the table, just barely touching with his hands because heaven forbid, he shouldn't get any things on his Rolex president watch. So it's a different style. My style is, I don't care. I want to be, I want them hugging me. I want them jumping up on me. I want them licking my face. It's okay. Because that's, that's what makes me happy. And apparently, from the success I have, and these dogs literally who come into the office can't wait to see me. It is the best thing ever to walk out in a waiting room and to have all these dogs literally with excitement. I have dogs that they hear my voice and down the hallway and they start getting excited. And, you know, it's funny. There, there's, uh, yeah, I've been to many uh, management meetings. I often lectured on, on management at the veterinary conferences. And they're the experts. Now, I'm talking, these are board certified, certified veterinary practice managers, but they don't care about the heart of practice. They care about the finances. They care about how to make practice successful, how to you know, curb expenses, how to be more efficient. And they say that a veterinarian should not walk out into the waiting room. Of course, Dr. Jeff here completely disagrees because I feel it this way. Veterinarians don't spend money on marketing. You, know, you don't really see many advertisements so I, I did want to see a billboard coming back from Palm Springs about a veterinary advertising. Inefficient, that's inefficiency. But what's efficient is, so I walk out in a waiting room and the dog, I try to say hello to as many dogs as I can and, and cats. I don't have to go to them. They come to me and they're jumping up on me and they are just literally just showing love. And for that new client or person out there who has been to other veterinarians and sees how that behavior is or how their behavior is or lack thereof, and they see the bond that I've established with my patients. I don't need advertising. I, that, that is the best thing ever. That's what makes people comfortable with seeing a veterinarian is when they see their own pet loves coming to the vet. As I often say, as many times that you hear that a veterinarian is very similar to a pediatrician in the sense that our patients can't talk to us. We have to rely on mom and dad for clinical signs, what's going on, the symptoms, the history. The dog can't tell us. The cat can't tell us. So we have to rely on mom and dad. But the difference is that from the patient perspective, many, many kids, if not most, hate going to the doctor. They cry. If, if I walk into a room, I don't wear a white coat, and, but I used to. I don't know. It's, it's going to get too dirty. What do I need that for? So I'm walking in. So, but when I used to walk in with a, that white coat on and a stethoscope wrapped around my neck, if mom not only brought her pet, but also brought her little kid, the pet's jump, jumping up on me and giving me, you know, just kissing my face, and the little kid is crying. So that tells you the difference. The difference is my patients love to see me and my a pediatrician's patients do not love to see the pediatrician. So uh, it makes it pretty cool. All right, let's see. Hello, the Victoria. Uh, Eloise, hello. Eloise, I know you must have questions. So I bought a medicated wipe for my dog's feet after coming in from outside and chewing on feet incessantly. It has chlorhexidine, gluconate, micron nitrate. Is this okay? Not only is it okay, it's excellent. I have one such product also, my derma wipes, uh, also chlorhexidine, which is a great antibacterial. And I use ketoconazole, but my conazole is just fine. And the, the goal is, remember one thing about feet, is that the, the, the pads actually sweat. So a lot of times what you're going to see is you're going to see the two parts of a dog's body, we've talked about this before, that actually sweat, have what's called the ecrine sweat gland, are the pads and the nose. And if you hold up a pad, a foot, to a nose, you'll see it's the same kind of tissue. And those are the two places on a pet's dog's and cat's body that actually have that type of tissue. So that's why the feet are often moist. Well, here you want to have a, a, a situation where you have moisture, you have dirt, and you have the perfect environment for bacteria and yeast. So in fact, a lot of times if it's the hair in between the, in the bottoms of the feet, between the pads are really long, I often recommend having the groomer shave that. That way, if you want to use like those wipes or any wipes, anything or spray, I have a spray dermamist also with chlorhexidine and ketoconazole, then that's great. And also another product that 
I don't make because it's a, it's a prescription product and I, I don't do any prescription products, but it's called Neo Predef powder. It is amazing because not only does it have the anti-inflammatory and it has the antibacterial and the antifungal, it's also, oh, it also has a lidocaine, a local numbing agent, and it's in a talc powder form. So it absorbs a lot of that moisture. I love Neo Predef powder for things like that. It is great. Uh, Eloise, what do you do if your dog will not eat? I've tried doing food. I'm concerned. Can you scope a dog's stomach? Well, I don't do the scoping because you need a special instrument called an endoscope. I am a big fan of, but here's one thing I recommend before going to those lengths. And that is a lot of times when we have a dog that won't eat, I love that, put that in quotes, won't eat. And you've tried a number of different foods, dog foods, and they don't eat. Okay. Then you offer them some fresh steak or chicken or beef, something. And they eat it? Ah, that changed the picture here a little bit. So it's not that they won't eat. They just don't want to eat the food that you've given them, and uh, which is a pet food. So then you, the search starts to try to find something that they will eat. But for me, when you get to the point of scoping, that's, I wouldn't say it's a last resort, but it's certainly not early on in the game. So first of all, we're going to take a, a blood test and see if everything else is okay. Then I'm going to do the trick with offering some real good people food and see, are they really not eating? Now, if they're not eating, but they want, it looks like they want to eat, I'm going to inspect their mouth. That's much easier than going scoping and seeing what the teeth look like, seeing what the gums look like, seeing if there's any kind of severe gingivitis or periodontal disease or an oral abscess, something in the mouth that it's not that they don't want to eat. It's just that it hurts them to eat. So I would, I would examine that first. Now, usually if a dog has something you're going to find through scoping, it's not just not eating is a problem. There probably will be some vomiting. So uh, they might have some diarrhea. They might have some blood or in the diarrhea, that's more of a colitis, which is a large intestinal problem. Or if you see melina or melina, depending on your potato, potato, that is very black, tarry stool, which indicates bleeding in the stomach itself or intestinal tract. So by the time the stool comes out the other end, it is the blood now is turned black and tarry. That might indicate an ulcer or, or a mass that's bleeding somewhere in the stomach. That's when you get to the point of needing a scope. So it's not my first line of diagnostic, but it, it may be in there in a chronic problem where everything else is normal. The mouth is good. The blood's come back perfect. Everything is perfect. He won't even eat the steak, won't even eat the chicken. Now we have something that we have to do some exploring. And uh, you know that's where you pick up something like maybe an intestinal lymphoma or maybe another mass in the stomach, or maybe ulcers. So there are a lot of things to look for, but that's kind of my order. Four corgis, we are dog hair central. Yes, we're the same way. Tried to mush my dog's teeth, but they just eat the toothpaste. So I don't think it's doing anything. Now, I would agree. Now, let's let's talk about that for one second. Um, hey, Steve. Hey, JB. Let me just say wave hellos. So what's important to know, and if you understand the process of how you're getting, which is why we advocate really regular toothbrushing because dogs eat just like people eat. And what's left after we eat is a film on the teeth. And that's called plaque. Plaque by itself is not a problem. In fact, that's what we brush away. Now we brush away. We don't do brush our teeth twice a day or even more sometimes. Dogs don't. In a few days between the saliva in the mouth and oral bacteria, the plaque hardens. And that's when it becomes calculus or tartar, depending on what word you want to use. It's the same thing. You cannot get that off by brushing. So the key really why we recommend frequent brushing, at least, I mean, every day is best, but at least every other day, we don't want that plaque, that film to turn into tartar. Because once it does, <laughs> you're a poop out of luck. You got to have them professionally cleaned and it's got to be scraped away. So it is important to brush teeth. And guess what? You don't need a toothbrush. You need a finger brush at best. And, and I will show you next time I will give a demo how to do it properly. But when you buy the finger brushes, don't get the ones that are, you know, it's made out of a rubberish vinyl type of material where the bristles, quote unquote, bristles are the same material. Those aren't as effective. You want to get them and you can buy them. They're all over the internet. You can get the ones that the sleeve is that rubber material or plastic, hard, pla soft plastic. But the bristles are regular toothbrush type bristles. Those are the ones that are more effective. So there was one other question. And then uh, it's correction, and Mike and all wife's good to use dog's feet for itching. Yes, we talked about that 100%, and I would use them first. I mean, look, if there's itching, okay, there may be other things going. When, they, when they're when they really licking the, between the toes, 
You got to open the between the toes check, make sure there's no foxtail track, a drainage track under the feet, the same thing. If it's just red and raw and they're going after it, I would suspect food is a possible allergen. So you want to have that checked out. It also could be contact, but just because they're licking their feet, there could be other reasons. And by the way, by the way, some dogs, and then we're going to break for a commercial break in just a second. Some dogs, if you look at a feet, and they're itching, but you don't see saliva staining. You look underneath, you don't see redness. You don't see anything between the toes. They just sit there and are comfortably, casually licking at their feet. Guess what? That could be like more of an anxiety. It's almost like a thumb sucker or a nail biter. It just provides them some sort of relief, some anti-anxiety. It just they find it relaxing. And so they're not doing any damage, in which case, as long as they're not hurting anything, they're not causing a problem, and they like to do it, but they're not aggressive, they're not biting, they're just licking, licking, licking the tops of their feet. That's okay. So anyway, think about that. Why we go to break, and then we're going to come back, and we'll answer more questions for you. And um, ah, great one from Victoria. So Victoria, we're going to talk about that. It's a great question. Thank you so much. So don't go away. What changes in the personality of a dog after being spayed or in a male neuter? Great question. We'll be right back after these short messages. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There is no other pet related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, TuneIn, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> And we're back live here. I'm getting the thumbs up. I'm getting a couple of thumbs up. I'm hard. So uh, anyway, I want to go backwards. And we're going to talk about the next question that is from Victoria. So how, first, how am I fine? How are you doing? <laughs> I just want to make sure you're doing okay. Anyway, how much does the personality of a female puppy change after being spayed? Here's the thing that overall, look, all my dogs are fixed. All my cats are fixed. I have five, five dogs, four male and a female. I have seen no change whatsoever. Sometimes I actually wanted to see change. Two of my dogs are the most obnoxious dogs on the planet when it comes to other dogs. And my Frenchie is such a hunter. I've, I know you know this with our Frenchies. I hear it all the time that if there is a squirrel or a skunk or a raccoon, anything in my neighborhood, they go bonkers. He's already been skunked twice. You think it'll stop him? Not a chance. He can't wait. He can't wait for the next one. So I find there's very little true personality change. Here's the change that I, I warn people. That one of the many energies that dogs have is sexual energy. And that, of course, that's why we do it. That might change. So you may find that if you're feeding your dog X amount of food and then you get them fixed, that same X amount of food might, might put on some weight. So they, they add some pounds. So what you may need to do is you may need to reduce their caloric intake just a little, maybe 10%, 15% once they're, once they're spayed or neutered. But other than that, I find... They don't sit around. They're still active. My dogs can't wait to run outside. You take them to a park. They go to a friend's house. They are extremely, very active, very animated. They jump around. They, 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 you know, we go, when we go at night, they come upstairs with us. They jump into the bed. Nothing's really changed. So, I mean, some dogs, they, I, I, I hear, I, it's never happened to me, and I've had silly kids of dogs over the years, but, you know, there's some dogs that become a little bit less active, a little bit more aloof. They maybe sit around a little more because they're less energy. And then what happens though, though, is if they lose that sexual energy and you don't modify their diet or increase their exercise just a tad, and they do put on weight, now, now that change in wanting to exercise has nothing to do with the fact they're spayed or neutered, has something to do with the fact that they put on a few pounds and now it's not as easy for them. So it's very important to keep an eye on that, keep their weight lean, but I would never say don't spare and neuter because it's going to change that personality. All right. Uh, there was a question here. I want, ah, New York mom, what is your opinion? Fresh food like farmer's dog versus dog, good kibble, worth it or hype? Oh boy. That's a tough question. I would never say to somebody, oh, you need to go get this kind of food in general. 
as we talked about micro tier, if the food is AFCO certified, that's certified by the Association of American Feed Control Officials, if your dog likes it, if they have energy, if they have a shiny coat, if they have good stool, and that food is, they're doing well on that food, then by all means, stay there. There's no, now, do some dogs like more, more of that fresh type of food versus kibble? You'll know it. What you do is if there's any doubt, offer them both. And if they really seem to go after one, farmer's dog is, is very good and not a problem. Food for dogs, they can be very good. There are a lot of Zool, which is one of my favorite Frenchie foods. And my son's Frenchie is on it and does amazingly well, Z-U-E-L. So those, look, they're usually more expensive. So if you for yourself feel better feeding your dog a food like that, and you don't mind the expense, and they meet all the criteria, the, the dogs do, they do like it, they have good stool, they have a shiny coat, they have lots of energy, they go for it, that's fine. But don't switch just because. If your dog's doing well in what he's, he or she is eating, stay there. If you want to try something because of your own personal feelings, or you read the ingredients and there are things in it you don't like, you see a lot of preservatives, you see a lot of byproducts, and you don't like that, that's okay. You know what the experts say, when a dog, and you always say it goes back to nature. Well, when the dog, the wolf, ate everything, you think they only ate the meat? Heck no, they ate everything. They ate the byproducts. They ate the organ meats. So whatever makes you feel good, but make sure that A, it's convenient for you. You can meet the price points. And most importantly, AFCO certified and your dog seems to like it. If they like it and all their criteria are met, then go for it. Uh, what's the powder talc again? It's called Neo Predef powder, N-E-O dash Predef, P-R-E-D-E-F. Only available online with, with a prescription from your vet or at your vet. And uh, But I love Neopred of powder, especially if your dog has these. Uh, what's good low phosphorus protein for dogs? Well, phosphorus itself isn't given a lot of protein. Now, if a dog has a you know a lot of phosphorus, then we need to like drop that a little bit if they have kidney disease. You notice the three enzymes you look at with kidney disease are creatinine, the most important, because that's the one that's the most affected directly to kidney. Then you have BUN, which is also kidney, but it's affected also by hydration at the time of the test, also by protein in the food. So the BUN, blood, urea, and nitrogen can go up, but it's not directly always just kidney. There are other factors, and same with phosphorus, can be very diet related. So in looking at kidney foods, for example, we're looking at low phosphorus in the food and also using possibly something that is a phosphate binder, a packaging, for example. There are certain foods and products on the market that seem to bond to phosphate and take it out to drop the blood phosphate. So you can talk to your veterinarian and um, they'll give us some suggestions. Now, if a dog will eat people food, they can't live on that, right? Well, they can, but if you're going to feed just people food, you like to balance it. So you want to look for something. I have my, for example, my body boost. The reason we came up with body boost is it's a multivitamin mineral supplement. And it doesn't have to be ours. It could be any, you look for a supplement that will, in fact, if someone just told me there's a product on the market, I forget the name, that's like a topper. It's like a gravy you put on the food that's all balanced. So you're taking something that may not be balanced. I said, it doesn't say it is not. It may not be balanced depending on what products are going into that natural home cooked diet or people food, and you're supplementing it. So it won't be a problem to have people food. Some dogs can do, do fine on people food. Obviously, you want to see a veterinarian, check values, check enzymes, check protein levels. If they're doing fine, that's okay. If not, get something, get a body boost, get some sort of supplement to help neutralize and balance that which may be missing. And I use that word carefully, may be missing in the home cooked or people food diet. Okay. Hire dog training if your dog is any network with your vet. This is true. If your dog is a dog that seems to be anxious and something, you know, you know licking the feet, unless it's just all day long. But if a dog sits down in one part of the day and lifts their feet, I'm not worried. But if they have that and other anxiety issues, for example, separation anxiety, destructive behavior, excessive barking, things like that, then yes. In fact, on our Talk Shop Live show today, we're going to talk about that. And one of the things that these trainers recommend is you need to get, you know, before you go to bed or before you're going to leave them alone, you want to get them outside. You want to take them to the park. You want to exercise them because if they burn up a lot of energy, then they will have less energy to exhibit that anxiety behavior. So, and many experts feel that sometimes one of the things that we can do to help these dogs is to get them out, spend more time with them exercising. And we're going to talk about that today on the show and on products that I have that might help that. Cleaning ears, cleaning paws, shampoo that helps with itching. Talk Shop Live sells all. Yes, we have. I mean, all these things, ears, paws, shampoo, 
what I try to do in coming up with the products I come up with are coming up products that are available OTC over the counter, easy for you to get. You can order easily and you don't necessarily have to go to your veterinarian. And one thing I'll tell you, and where I'm at now included, because the prevalence of these really good products, necessary products online, what's happening is the same thing that's happening at the retail level in stores. Everybody's going online. Everybody's going to Amazon. Everyone's going to Chewy. Everyone's going to, you know, 800 pet meds. So why should we spend money as a business? That makes sense on these products that are so readily available. People aren't going to come in. They sit on the shelf. They're not being purchased. It's inventory money, it's inventory control. It just adds an extra layer of issues, potential issues. So many, many veterinary hospitals now are not carrying the things that you can so easily get online. So if you have any questions on what those products are, then you can, as I said, just let me know anytime or stick around at 10 o'clock. You can go to talkshop.live and we're going to talk about those types of products. All right. Waving, waving. Thank you, Janice. We, uh, we do appreciate that. And let's see. Clients issue with taking groomers care, care babysitters there eight months. Do you recommend waiting until a year? So as far as I assume, uh, Eloise, we're talking about neutering in Spain and how a lot of groomers in place like that don't want a dog that's intact. Personally, as you know, as a Labrador, I am very, a powerful recommendation. Obviously, I can't insist on anything with your dog is to wait, come up with an alternative solution because there's enough studies out there that these especially large breed dogs that have a history or are known as a breed to get bone cancer, a statistic that was shocking in the male, a 65% greater incidence and in a female, a 35% greater incidence in long bone cancer as a senior dog in those dogs that were pre-pubertally neutered or spayed. So eight months is still pre-pubertal, and I would not recommend neutering a Labrador before a year minimum, a year and a half even better. So obviously, it's your decision. Try to come up with an alternative solution to take them to a dog, doggy daycare if they don't want a dog that's not been neutered. I think that they should change their policies. Maybe they should keep these dogs separate. You know, it's a tough one because I don't run their business, but I would advise not to neuter or spay a dog that young, a large breed, especially smaller breeds. Yeah, because they don't get bone cancer typically, but a large breed, I would be extremely cautious. All right. Hi, what do you feed your Frenchie? I'll ask you for your friend. Okay. My Frenchie could eat what my other dogs eat. Not a problem. My son's Frenchie, strong food allergy. And we put him on Zool, C-U-E-L. It used to be called Frenchie Gourmet. They had to change the name for some trademark issue. I don't know. But the guy named Brad. He formulates it specifically for Frenchies. And I have recommended, I don't, I don't carry it. I don't sell it. But I will tell you that he has put a number of my Frenchie patients on it. And they do extremely well. And my son's dog, when, I mean, I literally, it was so bad. I sent it to a veterinary dermatologist because I couldn't solve it. He was on everything. We finally switched him over at the time, Frenchie Gourmet, now to Zool. And he is doing, knock on wood, he's doing great. So look it up, uh, Z-U-L. And uh, it comes like the other dog foods in a wrapper, like a uh, farmer's dog and just a food for dogs. It's a little pricey, but I got to tell you, he's spending less given the fact that he doesn't have to have all the meds and the stuff that I do. So it works out really well. So um, try it out. Uh, just food dogs is great. It's own ingredient treats. Good. You know, no, I, I think it is great. Uh, let's see, explain the difference between pulmonary hypertension and high blood pressure in dogs. So with pulmonary, high blood pressure is overall, okay? And it can happen for a number of reasons. Pulmonary hypertension is where you, you have basically a, a heart disease that is putting a lot of pressure on the pulmonary arteries. And then because of that, we're filling up pressure and there's leakage of the blood through the pulmonary artery and it goes into the lungs. So secondary to pulmonary hypertension, if it's not treated, is we're going to get congestive heart disease. So it is a form, it is a high blood pressure, but it's the hypertensive is hypertension is in that pulmonary vasculature, and that is causing high blood pressure in those areas, which is then leading to congestive heart disease, where a lot of that fluid leaks into the lungs, and therefore you get you get a lot of fluid in the lungs, and that is the usually it's secondary to left heart disease, which is more common than right heart disease, when we see a lot of fluid buildup in the abdomen because of what we call ascites, that is usually right heart failure. So anyway, that's before the blood even gets injected through the pulmonary artery outside the lungs. So that's what happens. So 
you're still going to need to be treated. There are medicines I recommend. And if there's a dog that has severe heart, not even severe, heart disease, a murmur, maybe an enlarged heart on x-ray, even though the lungs look clear, I would highly advise an echocardiogram from either someone who really does them, preferably a veterinary cardiologist. There are so many values that we can't tell from x-ray. We can't tell from an EKG, but we can from an echocardiogram. It is the new standard, the minimum standard. When we have heart disease, it needs to be evaluated and treatment decided upon is going to be through echocardiography. And I want to try to get to everybody. You guys have been great audience today. And it's time for me to uh, say goodbye. I got to get ready for my next show. Bring my cat in for a dental. That's opting out for blood tests. What fa- oh, that's a great question. And this is going to be the last one because I got to get moving to my next show. And that is, why do a blood test? Well, anytime anesthesia is going to be administered, we really should have a blood test. It's almost like baby malpractice, not. If there was a problem, and then you take a blood test after the fact and find there was an issue in the blood, and you went ahead and anesthetized anyway, that's a problem. Now, how crazy am I about doing it for any animal that I always look to see, first of all, the age, that determines not are we going to do a blood test, but are we going to do a full panel, like a senior panel that has soup to nuts or just the basics? So if it's a young, healthy dog, then I'm going to just do the basics. I'm not. I'm going to do a CBC and just the, the major organs. And there's like, we have what's called a vet screen. It's called a pre-op screen. That's plenty. Now, if we have a recent blood test on a healthy dog, a healthy young dog, say four or five years of age, who had a blood test like maybe three months earlier, I'm not going to go nuts. As long as everything has stayed exactly the same, appetite, attitude, everything's the same as it was three months ago, I'm okay with it. There are a lot of places out there that are going to, you could have had a blood test last week and they're going to insist on another blood test. I have my issues with that personally. But you know, I'm not going to go there. I would almost bet it's a corporate practice. Whatever it is, I'm not going there. You can get out of these comments what you are thinking that I'm trying to say. But but something, either a recent blood test should have been done, or at least a a mini panel. But as the animals get older, usually older is over than seven. I'm going to do a full panel prior to any anesthesia. So there was another question here. Oh, after our mod in my area, oh God, you know, I, I have my feelings as you know about VCA. ASEC, which is a VCA, is good. I like it. There's a new one in Santa Monica called VEG, V-E-G, Veterinary Emergency Group. I like them a lot. Access Thrive, are, I'm okay with. You just have to know what you're getting into. I would use AirVet first. If you have a downloaded AirVet, download AirVet, all right? And, I, and you will find out that probably 90% of those emergencies aren't. And you don't necessarily have to run to emergency. You're talking real time with a veterinarian, regardless of the time of day or night, and they see the animal, they hear your history, they ask you some questions. Based on those answers, they're going to decide, you know what, this can wait. Or you know, when you start a call, it's good for 72 hours. So you can hang up the phone, right? And then an hour, two hours later, something might change. You can go back on, you go to open cases that put you back in touch with that veterinarian and say, okay, here's what's going on now. And he might say, you know what, at that point, maybe you should go to your local emergency, but don't run to emergencies right away because I'm telling you from what I've, I've done over 4,000 virtual visits on AirVet and I've sent maybe 200, 250 to emergency. Most are not emergencies. They can freak you out, but they're not emergencies. All right. So I do appreciate the large number of people we had guests today. Love it. AirVet is great. Thanks, Todd. I think so too. Hello, Tina. We'll see you soon. Okay. AirVet saved my dog's life. Yeah. No, no. I love AirVet too. All right. So that's all we have time for today. I got to get ready for my next show. If you want to join me and get more information, by the way, I'm not there just you know promoting product. I'm there to answer your questions. So if you have questions that you didn't get to today, or you want to talk more about, or something you just remembered after you, we stopped the show, please just join me. It's talkshop.live. You don't have to buy anything, but you get to ask questions and, uh, and tell us your story. So I'd love to hear from you. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Same bad time, same bad channel here on Pet Life Radio, here on Instagram Live. And again, thanks for joining me. Love your questions. Love being here with you. And I'll tell you this, it makes my day. If I can help you even even a little bit, I still look at that as satisfaction. I appreciate it. See you next week. Bye-bye. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.